Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Happy, what are we on? Tuesday night. Coming to you from the East Coast. How goes it? Do me a favor, jump in the chat window and say hello. Feel free to send to all panelists. I'd love to hear from Mary. Hi. Hello, hello. Welcome to our free GRE prep hour. I realize how dirty my glasses are. <laughs> oh, nice. Welcome from Indiana. Welcome, Nico. I'm Whitney, or Wit. You can call me either of those things. I'm a full-time instructor and curriculum developer here at Manhattan Prep, and I am coming to you from Durham, North Carolina. Uh, so I am in the seat of ACC basketball here. So if you are fans of UNC Duke or NC State, uh, they're, they're all my neighbors. <laughs> How goes it tonight? How are you guys feeling? I've got one, one person in Indiana. Where are the rest of you guys? Give me your state so I know where everybody is. So I can get a sense of where you guys are. Cool, another East Coaster. Lots of East Coasters. Boston, New York. Couple of Bostons. Ooh, we got Cali, Columbus. Lots of New York, Jersey, Rhode Island. Very cool. Florida. Nice. Nice, nice. Guys, I'm excited for what we're going to do tonight. Um, we are going to be using a lot of problems out of our GRE five pound book. Um, you can get it on our website or you can get it from you know, Amazon. Um, it's a book chock full of lots and lots of practice problems. What we're gonna do tonight is we're going to take a look at one of the primary question types in the quantitative section of the GRE, and it's called QC or quantitative comparisons. And we're going to look at a, a very specific technique that we'll use um, to simplify kind of ugly QC problems. But before we get to it, I want to look at just, you know, a couple of QC problems to get us warmed up and get us going, um, and, and just to sort of practice our techniques for QC. Just sort of see how it is. Um, so I'm going to give you guys just a really simple kind of refresher on QC. So we'll do like, just, you guys will love this one. Nice and nice and easy QC. Um, do me a favor, type in the chat window. How familiar are you guys with the GRE? How long have you guys been studying? A month? A week? Today is the first day you started studying the GRE. Two days. I just started. <laughs> I love it. Okay, cool. I, very cool. All right, so we're going to take a second um, before we jump into our fun little lesson on like ways of simplifying, um, just to take a moment to, to sort of acknowledge what the heck a QC problem is um, and, and how it fits into the section as a whole. And so what? take a moment just to look at the quant section of the GRE. So when you sit down to take the GRE, for those of you guys that are still sort of new, um, you're going to see different sections. So you'll do two essays at the beginning, and then you're going to move your way through five different topic area sections. And two of them will be quant, two of them will be verbal, and then you'll have like a third of one of them. So you might get a third quant or a third verbal. Um, and then one of those five will be experimental. And you won't know which one. There'll be no way to tell. But when you're inside of a quant section, the order of the section is going to always be the same. And so you're going to spend the first six to seven questions on a question type known as QC or quantitative comparison. Now, we want to start to learn to get pretty fast at quantitative comparison because for the section as a whole, we've only got about a minute 45 per question. So it's not a lot of time to do math. And so quantitative comparisons needs to be a place where we um, can speed up the process. And that's really what we're going to work on tonight is another technique for getting a little faster and more efficient at QC. The remainder of the quant section will be made up of data interpretation, that's like graphs, and then discrete quant is just a fancy name for kind of more classic math problems. 
Often these are multiple choice or fill in the blank. Yeah. Um, and so just a really simple upfront QC problem just to try one out. Um, what this will look like is you'll have two quantities, quantity A and quantity B. Um, you may be given some upfront information as you are in this problem, right? You're given this upfront information, x equals 2y. And then you've got four different answer choices. And so those four answer choices are that quantity A is always greater, quantity B is always greater. Maybe it's the case that the two quantities are equal to one another, um, or you can't really determine the relationship. Right? You can't tell, um, is one quantity always bigger than the other? And so basically what you're trying to do is imagine, if you will, right, that there's like a symbol that would sit in the box between these two sides. Like you were in a, an equation or an inequality almost. And what you're trying to figure out is which of these symbols, greater than, less than, equals to, would fit into this box. Is it that X is always bigger than Y? Or is X always smaller than Y? Is it the case that they're always going to be equal or I can't land on one? So let's try this one. We're just going to take 45 seconds, right? We're going to kind of like whip our way into this question. I'd love for you to change the chat and have it just sent to like panelists. So it's not sent to attendees as well, just to panelists. So it just comes to me. And when you think you've got it, I want you to send me your answer for this question. Let's see what you guys get. So again, we'll take about 45 seconds. All right, I got lots of answers in. Awesome, awesome. Um, so let's take a moment, right? Um, when we're dealing with QC, right, our goal is truly to compare. Um, and one of the things I wanna bring to your attention is the idea that it is possible for the relationship to be unclear, right? It is possible. And so one of the most effective ways that we find, right, and we recommend it strongly um, as part of our curriculum, of handling QC is to try and actively prove D. Right? Like, so this kind of underlying thought behind QC is to prove D. And so we're going to try and prove D by, by trying to see, can I get more than one of these relationships? And a really common technique is going to be to plug in numbers. Let me just pick some values and plug them in. Now, if I start to do that, if I start plugging in numbers, we want to think a little creatively. We have a fun little acronym uh, called Zone F, Z O N E F. And Zone F represents uh, very specific types of numbers that you would pick. So numbers like zero or one negative numbers, extreme values. So kind of thinking like, what if it was really big? What if it was really small? What if it's really negative? What if it's really positive? And then fractions. And we're gonna try and test a handful of numbers in order to, to force a D. Can I show more than one relationship? Yeah. So if we were just gonna like start throwing numbers and problems from the very beginning, we could just do that. I could say, all right, I'm going to pretend here, right, if x is zero, for example, then that would mean that y has to be zero as well. Huh. So quantity a is zero, quantity y is zero, 
that would mean that the symbol in this box would be an equal sign. And that would mean that if that was the only possible relationship, I would choose answer choice C. Give me another set of numbers. Somebody type in the chat window and you can type this to panelists and attendees. Come back to the public window again. Um, what is a different set of numbers that you could pick for X and Y? Ooh, I love it, right? Like let's pretend, and you can make these any of them. It might be easier to plug in for Y. Um, yeah, but what if like Y is a half or something or Y is two? Any of those work, right? If Y is two, then X is four. I'm gonna put that in my quantity, so that would be four versus two. I showed a different relationship. I showed that four was bigger than two, which means if I can get more than one relationship, then I don't actually know if this is an equation or an inequality in which direction it is. And since I don't know, I'm gonna choose All right, so let this sink in for a minute. When we're talking about quantitative comparison, what we're actively trying to do is to get our quantities to be as easily comparable as possible because what we're eventually gonna potentially wanna do is plug in numbers so that we can try and force different relationships. Does a certain value make one quantity bigger than the other? And then when I change that value, does that relationship change? Right, so we're trying to like prove D. That's the goal, prove D. So on the way to proving D, right, this is what we're gonna talk about tonight, is that it can be really, really tempting to start right away with picking numbers. Right? Like from the very beginning, start by picking numbers. When in fact, our first move, no matter what, <clears throat> yes, 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 yes. So um, I've got a great comment in the window, Demarius, it's beautiful. The first step is, can I simplify? And so this is gonna be where we spend our time tonight. And we're gonna do it on one specific version of simplify, but in general, this is what we're gonna talk about. So our job, kind of build this over on the right, is to try and simplify first, right? So before we start plugging numbers in, can we begin by simplifying? And I love, it seems like such a simple idea, right? It seems like it might not even be a big deal, but if I clean all this off, and instead say, hold on, look at this upfront information. Can I use that somehow to simplify? Sometimes that means we're actually gonna simplify the content up there, right? So you might be simplifying the given info, and we'll see an example of that. You might also simplify within a quantity. And so this is kind of a combo of that, where, hey, if this is X and that's X, couldn't I just rewrite this as 2Y? and compare that with Y. I want you guys to get in the habit of this box in the middle. Even if you've been doing QC forever, put that box in the middle. I promise you it's gonna serve you in the long run. Now, it may not seem like much because I'm still gonna have to pick numbers, but now I don't have to worry about an X and a Y, I can just think about a Y. So now if Y is zero, both quantities are zero, my representation would be an equal sign, but if Y is anything other than zero, if Y is one, this is one, um, rather, this is two, this quantity is two times one, and this one's just one, and so now quantity A is bigger. If I chose a negative, which I didn't have to, I just need to show two different relationships. If I showed a negative, two times a negative one, negative two, just the negative one, a negative one, I'm, I'm better off if I only owe you a dollar than if I owe you two. <laughs> right? I'd rather only owe you one. And so negative one is actually a bigger number than negative two. So all I want to do when I'm doing QC, ideally, is show two different relationships. That's it. That's all I want to try and accomplish. If I fail, right, if I keep getting the same symbol, like equals, 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 or greater than, greater than, greater than, then I'm going to start to trust that the answer is actually one of these letters, A, B, or C. But my active goal is to try and reach for D. I mean, that's, my, that's my active goal. Okay, so that said, if we just start to launch in with picking numbers, which is something that's gonna happen once you get studying, and maybe for those of you who've already been studying, you've kind of seen a glimpse of this, that there's this tendency to just start plugging in numbers as fast as you possibly can, right? We might start running into, and I'm gonna show you this problem, but we'll see it again. We're not gonna solve it right now, but you might run into a problem like this. And my question for you is like, do you, do you actually wanna 
start just plugging numbers in wildly right away. <laughs> Right? Like, you can throw me a smiley face or a thumbs up or what have you, but like, is this really something, you know, like, that you would actually want to start plugging in numbers for? <laughs> no, right? I don't want to start plugging in numbers for this. Not right away. There's X's, there's Y's, there's Z's, there's exponents. Oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. Like, if everything's zero, maybe that's not a big deal, but it can start getting messy really quickly, especially if they start to limit the types of values that I'm allowed to use. And so what we want to do is we want to think about how we can simplify first, right? Like that's all we want to do. Let's think, how do we simplify first? So sometimes a simplification, it's a little reminder of some rules. I'll have you guys help me with that. Sometimes your simplification of the given information is enough. So can somebody help me out? What is the rule for the angles in a triangle? I don't expect you guys to remember these rules, but if anybody does and can help, yeah, the sum of them is 180. Beautiful. And so if the sum of these three angles is going to be 180, that means that this angle, right, if this is 60 and 50 is 110, this leftover angle is 70 degrees. What's true about angles that make up a line? They're also 180 degrees. Yeah, so if this angle is 60, then Y has to be the 120 degrees. And that same logic will apply over here. If this angle is 70 degrees, then X is gonna be the remaining 110. I'm gonna take that information, I'm gonna plug it straight into my statement, or into my quantities, right? Quantity A is X, so X is 110. Plug in the given information into my quantity. Plug this given information into this quantity. I didn't have to do any work. There's no plugging in at all, right? Like I don't have to pick my own numbers. I don't have to think about zone F. I get the answer right away. The correct answer here would be quantity B is bigger. So we've always got, can I simplify the given information and even plug that given information in to one of the two quantities? And can we do that ideally before we start getting all excited and plugging stuff in? So I want you guys to try it with this one. I'm gonna give you about a minute, minute 15, and then again, set your chat just to panelists. And then I want you to tell me what you think the answer is this time. All right. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I got a couple, actually, a couple of people who are like, oh, I'm kind of stuck. I'm not sure what to do. So who wants to maybe give it a try? I'll, I'll get you access on the mic. If there's anybody that, raise your hand if you'd like to jump on and see if you could explain it to us, what you tried, what you did. Nice. All right. Cool. So Dominic, hit me with it. You're, you should be able to get on mic now. Oh, I think you're on mute. So you're, yeah, oh, you now? Yeah, no? there you go. Okay, so basically what I did is first simplify. So I moved the minus 2x on, on the left. So 3x plus 5x is 5x. Oh, okay, so you added a 2x to both sides. Yeah, cool. yeah, in both sides. Mm -hmm. Then... Uh, I was looking at the two quantity, one is 5s and the other is y, so I said 
why maybe we could just uh, substitute 5x plus 2 in the quantity b that is y. And then I just pick numbers. And even though that I was, uh, the first number that I did was 1. So the first one, x will be 5 plus 1 equals 5. And the other one will be 7. And the other number that I picked was 0. x is 0. So, and the other number will be 0. But in quantity b, it will be 2. Mm -hmm. Nice. And we could keep going. We should probably test another sort of weird number, like maybe a negative or a fraction. Right? Because negatives will usually do weird things. So yeah. if I picked x is negative 1. Yes. This becomes negative 5. What, this is negative 5 plus 2. What's negative 5 plus 2? So I, I was but, in the whole $5, but now I got $2. So I handed me 2 bucks. Minus 3? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I only, I'm only in the whole now minus 3, but that's still bigger. Yeah. Nice. And so what we do is we keep getting that same response. The quantity B just keeps being bigger. It keeps being bigger. It keeps being bigger. We're going to see another trick for this in a second. We'll come back to this and see another way where we can take it even one step further. But for where we are right now, this is perfect. Right? So one of the things we'll do is we can simplify. Right? And that simplification might be that we you know, solve things like a word problem or a geometry problem. It might be that we rearrange and simplify a little math and then we like plug into one of our quantities and boom, now we can plug in and now it makes things a lot easier to work on, right? So these are the different ways that I want you guys to start to say like, okay, maybe I really should simplify first. Right? My job is to simplify first. Now, sometimes your simplification is going to be like literally just um, simplifying within a quantity, right? So this is an example. We're going to do this one together. Just because this one's not the easiest thing in the world, and some of the concepts on this one are pretty tough. But if I'm looking for the least common multiple of 22 and 6, that's something I'm going to have to come up with. i got to figure it out. Right? It's the smallest number that would be like a multiple of 22, so 22, 44, 66, and so on. The smallest one of those that is also a multiple of 6. Right? So if my multiples of 22 are you know, 22, 44, 66, this is the first one that is also a multiple of 6. So I simplify quantity A by, by actually solving it. Quantity B, I do the same. What's the greatest factor? So what's the biggest number that divides into both of these? Well, 66 is divisible by 6 and 11. 99 is divisible by 9. And hey, there's the biggest number that goes into both, except that, wait, hold on. This number is, if we start to look through all of its multiples, I can think of the actual factors of 1 and 66. I've also got 3 and 22, 6 and 11. This is 1 and 99, 3 and 33, 9 and 11, right? The biggest number that goes into both of them right, would be what? Oh, and I think I missed one. I missed one here, didn't I? Yeah, what did I miss? You guys have to catch me. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Right, I got to be really careful. I missed, if I could grab this and move it. I missed two. And 33. But either way, the greatest common factor of 66 and 99 is smaller than the smallest common multiple of 22 and 6. Right, so maybe it's just that we simplify in the quantities. And when we do that, it's going to be working through various, you know, concepts. We'll be tested on things like geometry. Things like number properties, like this, like divisibility and prime numbers. We'll be tested on things like statistics or quadratics and all the stuff that you're going to be studying or have been studying if you've been at it for a little while. But I want to add a trick. And this is a trick that works for any kind of quantities, for any kind of concepts. And it can help save you a ton of time. And it's something that we call the hidden inequality. So I want you to draw that box between the two quantities because that's that thing. We're looking for that symbol. I'm looking for 
you know, greater than or less than or equal to. So let's start with just a little silly game for a second, right? So here's my quantity A and my quantity B. If quantity A is 12 and quantity B is 20, I'm about to ask you guys the easiest question in the world, which one's bigger? What's the correct answer? A, B, C, or D? Or what's the correct symbol that goes between these two? Either one. Yeah, <laughs> right, pretty easy. What would happen if I added the same value to both sides? So I said 12 plus five, 20 plus five. What happens to the symbol? Stays the same, right? <laughs> Stays the exact same. It's 17 versus 25. Um, what if I had instead subtracted the same thing from both sides? This is a 20. What would I get there if I subtracted the same thing from both sides? Nothing changes, right? Nothing changes. And the reason is because what I'm doing is I'm comparing two sides of a scale. I'm comparing two sides of a possible equation, right? possible inequality here. And if I do the same thing to both sides, Right? If I add or subtract the same thing to both sides of an equation or an inequality, nothing changes. Right? The relative relationship stays the same. Right? Think about it like you've got a scale. If I add the same weight to both sides, it's not going to change the scale's relationship. And if I take the same amount of weight off of both sides, it's not going to change that relationship. So what we want to remember is that because in QC, we're just trying to compare. That's all we're trying to do. We're just trying to compare. But if I can start to remove weight from both sides, remove extra terms from both sides, it's going to make my comparison that much easier. Right? And addition and subtraction is our most powerful move by far. So if we were to go back, right, let's go back to our problem that we saw at the beginning. Right? And when we got to this problem, It was simplified down to 5x compared with 5x plus 2. Notice that the two sides have something in common. Look at what they both have. On both sides of the scale sits a positive 5x. Yep. Which means this plus 5x on the left and this plus 5x on the right are not changing the relationship between the sides. And since it's that same weight on both sides, I can grab it, pull it straight off. And so we'll do that by just representing it as math. I can subtract a 5x from both sides. And so now what I'm left with, if I take a 5x and I subtract 5x from it, what am I left with? I got nothing. I have nothing over there, right? Which is cool. That's okay. I can have nothing. That's allowed. I can have a zero in a quantity. And on the right-hand side, I have a two. Well, the relationship just became easy as could be. I never even have to plug in a number now, right? Quantity B is absolutely bigger. So what we're working towards is this idea of minimizing how much plugging in we need to do. And so our first primary tool is this idea of a hidden inequality where we can add to or subtract from both sides, whatever we want to make our lives a little easier. And so as we've been talking about this idea that I can simplify the given information or I could simplify within each quantity, the good news is I can actually simplify across the quantities. And this is one of those tricks that a lot of people never put into practice when in fact it's one of the more powerful ones. Now we're gonna talk about sort of an advanced step onto this. But I want to start by saying anyone and everyone can and should be using the hidden inequality when it comes to adding and subtracting things from both sides. Okay, so that's what we're going to practice. We're going to practice looking for common terms. Even in like weird, complicated expressions, we're going to look for common terms that we might be able to add or subtract from both sides. Right? And then we're going to solve. So I want you guys to give this one a shot. You have 45 seconds. Send me an answer when you think you got it.
Nice. Very nice. So what's my first move? What can I eliminate? Without having to mess with it at all, what can I eliminate? Yeah. I've got a negative three-fifths, so I'm subtracting three-fifths from the left, and I'm subtracting three-fifths from the right. That's the same thing. So if I treat this as my hidden inequality, so I'm remembering that this is kind of like two sides of an equation, and I'm trying to figure out what symbol goes in there, then I can add a three to the fifth to both sides. So I can use my basic arithmetic. When I add the three to the fifth to both sides, there they go. And so now I have the much easier task of comparing 3 cubed to 9 squared, which I can calculate. 9 squared, 81. 3 times 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. And so I have this less than symbol, which is quantity B. Quantity P is always bigger. And so what we're doing is, again, we're just saving ourselves a little work. Right. Looking for common terms. We'll try it again. 45 seconds. So let's see. Start getting me some answers. And it's okay if you didn't get all the way to an answer. The biggest thing I want you to come up with is like, how do I simplify this? What can I do before I start picking values for A? Right? Before I start choosing positive values for A and plugging them in. Yeah, there's a 12A squared on both sides. I'd rather not plug something into a squared thing. And so I'm going to subtract 12a squared from both sides. And so now I'm down to 10a minus 19. 4a minus 9. At this point, I'm probably going to have to try a few things. Let's see what happens when a is 1. That's negative 9 or negative 5. Quantity b is bigger. I might try something extreme, like I might try and pick kind of a big number, like A is 5 or something. So 50 minus 19 is 31, or 20 minus 9 is um, 11, right? So this is what I mean by extremes, you kind of swing. So 20 minus 9 is going to be 11, which now in this case, quantity A is bigger. <laughs> yeah. No, totally okay. But notice that in order to try and prove D, in order to get this D, I was going to have to be willing to test bigger and bigger numbers. And because I'm going to try and think, all right, I got a less than. Let's see what happens if I pick a really different number. Or maybe I pick a really small fraction. Right? We're thinking extremes. This is what I mean by extreme. If I had to do that, like picking 5 or 10, and now I'm dealing with squared things times 12, like what a mess. I'm more able to think through the crazier cases if I just have fewer items to deal with. And so this is why we're starting to work on this idea of this hidden inequality. I wanna simplify across. I wanna simplify across. Now we can do this even when things are a little more complicated, right? Like a lot more complicated actually. Uh, so let's take a look at a problem like this one. Look how messy this is. I'll give you a minute 15.
where do we simplify? I don't want to be distracted by all of these like zero is less than a is less than b over two is less than nine and like all of this craziness in the two different quantities. Yeah, I'm just gonna remove this negative a over here. Right, like, let's just add an a on this side. We'll add an a on this side. There they go. Life. I don't need to deal with those anymore. And so now I'm really just comparing nine and b over two. And according to the information that's given, nine is bigger than b over two. So I didn't even have to do anything else. I can just be like, yep, okay. Quantity A is always bigger. Yeah. So you'd be amazed at how often ridiculously hard problems that seem really, really hard turn out to not be quite so hard. Right? Or at least relatively speaking, not quite so hard. So for some of these, we're going to have to practice a little bit of some uh, algebra first. So what happens if I have x times y plus z? If I have x times y plus z, what's the math? What's the arithmetic that I can use? Nice. So I'm going to take this x and I'm going to multiply it times the first term and then the second term. So I'm going to end up with xy plus xz. Hmm? Nice. What if I were to say x plus 1 times y plus 1? Now what do I have to do? Yeah, this is FOIL. For those of you that are like, wait, I haven't done this in forever. That's okay. This is FOIL. But it's the same thing as this distribution we do up here. I'm going to take the x. I'm going to take the first term. And I'm going to multiply it by the other first term. The first term times the other outer term. So first outer, right? Or it's just that x multiplies by these two. So I multiply x times y. And then I multiply x times that positive 1. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the 1. This will be plus y plus one. What is x plus two squared? What is x plus two squared? Hmm. Had a couple people guess x squared plus four. So here's the one, like, we're going to learn, like, a little baby bit of math that's going to help us out here. If I have x plus two in my parentheses, and I'm going to square that, when you hit the square, think about square as, like, the copy button on a copy machine. That whatever's inside those parentheses, I'm going to copy it a second time. So what that ends up being is actually x plus 2 times another x plus 2, right? So now I have to do my FOIL again. This is the world of a quadratic. And quadratics become wildly easier once we think about the hidden inequality. But I'm going to do my same first, x squared. Outer, so x times 2 is so 2x. And then my 2 gets on board and goes another 2x plus a 4. So this is x squared plus 4x plus 4. Now, a lot of times, you're going to be expected to be able to go backwards, right? that I would give you this version of it, and you have to know how to factor it. I'm going to talk a little bit about factoring. But sometimes, right? usually factoring is harder in some ways than it is to FOIL, to multiply it through. And so I want you guys to see how much easier some of these you know, quadratic QC problems can get when we remember that if anything's the same on both sides, we can just simplify it. So take a look at this and see what could you do to simplify within the quantities and then maybe simplify across. I'm going to give you guys a minute 45 for this one. I'll give you some, oops, I'll give you some extra time on this one.
can I do anything on this problem, at least to make it a little bit easier? It's a tough problem, right? This is a really tough problem. Is there anything I could do up front, at least to try and see if there was a way to simplify it? We gotta be careful. I love this idea. I got a great idea in the background. I was like, can we just take away the exponent? We wanna be a little careful of what happens when we square root both sides. Because I don't really know what's inside there, right? If the things inside there are like positives and negatives. And so I, I just want to be really careful. So I'm going to FOIL at first. I see common terms on both sides. I'm just going to see. So if this is x plus y times x plus y, this is x minus y times x minus y. Over here, I end up with x squared plus an xy plus a second xy and then plus 2y, or plus y squared, rather. Over here, I have x squared again. This time it's a minus xy, a minus a second xy, so minus 2xy, and then plus y squared. So what I can do now is look for anything that they have in common. They've both got an x squared. So those could go. They both have a y squared. Now, things have gotten substantially easier. It isn't easy, but at least it's a little better. And now if I have to start picking some numbers and kind of thinking about it, or I can start to rearrange, it might make my life easier. Now, again, we might need some advanced math once we get down to this point. But what we want to look for is, okay, Right. Can I get my quantities to a place that is simple enough right? or, or more simplified? Here we're going to have to start thinking about like, well, what would make this true? <laughs> right? If, if there's an X and Y on both sides, you might play with it a little bit. Like what if they were, you know, both one? Well, that wouldn't work because one isn't bigger than one. So you're going to have to play with signs a little bit and see which one's positive and which one's negative. That might take you a little time. But playing with that when all you're facing are these two quantities becomes a whole lot easier. Right? A whole lot easier. I'll pull that guy up before the end of class. We'll take a look. What could we do? then about this problem that I put up at the very beginning of class. What do you guys think? Type it in the chat window to um, all panelists and participants. What do you think we could do to this problem to make our lives easier? Because remember, we decided we were not going to just start plugging in numbers because that was just going to be a mess. We'll, we'll talk about that before the end of class or before the end of our session, Karina. We'll, we'll do the last one. We're going to hold off on it for this moment. Yeah, you can distribute quantity A. You can run through a distribution of quantity A. Nice. All right, so I want you guys to try it. Let's do it. Let's run through and distribute quantity A. And I'll give you guys a minute and 20.
So what happened when you multiplied out distributed quantity A? It's the first time we've seen this happen so far. What do we get when you distribute quantity A? And you don't have to write it all out, but I more mean, what do you end up finding? Yeah, you get quantity B, you get the exact same quantity. If I take X, Y squared and a Z, and I multiply it times two more X's and a Z, then I have three X's, two Y's, and two Z's. I'm gonna add that, now I've got one X, I've got two Y's and I add another one to it, so that's the third Y. I got one Z, multiply two more, that's three Z's. And then my last term, I've got two X's multiplied, four Y's, and one Z. I take a look over here at my quantity B, X cubed, Y squared, Z squared. Wait, those are the same on both sides. X times Y cubed, Z cubed. Wait, that's the same on both sides. <laughs> Minus X squared, Y fourth, Z. That's the same. Wait a minute. This is literally, if I were to subtract everything, they're the same. They're exactly equal to each other. Everything on the left is the same as everything on the right. So if I were to subtract it, I'd end up with nothing on both sides, which is like the perfectly even scale. And so I end up with this equal sign. So what I want you to think about is that you're going to want to test cases because it's a super powerful move, right? You're going to want to think zone F. Um, and it's one of the most prevalent things that you'll be doing throughout QC. But I want you to give yourself a moment to say like, could I simplify first? Is that possible? Is that possible for me to simplify first? And this shows up in so many ways. And often it shows up in these weird fancy quadratics, right? But sometimes it shows up as just this opportunity to let us um, rearrange or move pieces around so we can think about them differently. So I want to give you one more kind of crazy example. So let's go back to our initial little game. We are talking about quantity and quantity B. All right. So as long as you're comfortable with adding and subtracting things from both sides, you've gotten 92% out of this concept of the hidden inequality. I'm going to give you one more move. And it's the move of multiplication and division. Okay, let's say in quantity A, I have 12 again, and in quantity B, I have 20 again. If I were to multiply both sides by two, for example, okay, multiply this side by two, and multiply this side by two, what happened to my relationship? What is the relationship between quantity A and quantity B now if I multiply both sides by the same amount, by the same two? What do I get? And then send it to me in the chat window. What do I get? Yeah, I get the same relationship. 12 is less than 20, 24 is less than 40. The relationship didn't change, right? Didn't change. Okay, what if instead of multiplying both by two, I divide both by two? What happens? Did my relationship change? No, nope. six is still smaller than 10. The reason is that when I'm in an inequality, right, if I have the equation two X is less than four, I can divide both sides, just like an equation, by the same thing. Does anybody remember what the crazy rule is, though, for inequalities? Like, what do I have to be really careful of? What do I, yeah, so um, I got a few people in the background that are saying, like, flipping the signs. Yeah, I got to be really careful because when I multiply or divide by a negative number, all bets are off, right? So if I had, if I multiply both sides by two, great. If I divide both sides by two, also great. But if I were to multiply both sides, let's say in this case by negative two, I now have negative 24 up against negative 40, retro, my sign flipped. 
So here comes the like subtle move. Addition and subtraction, they are your best friends. You can use them whenever the heck you want. All right. Love them, own them, use them all the time. If you're multiplying or dividing by a positive number, you're allowed to do that too. You are allowed absolutely to multiply or divide by positive numbers. If the number is negative, or if it could be negative, so you gotta be real careful of variables, you cannot divide. You are not allowed to divide. No multiplying or dividing by negative numbers. So for a problem like this one, there we go. What could I do quickly to simplify the two sides of my expression? What could I do quickly? Yeah. I could multiply both sides by 82 because that's a positive number that didn't hurt anything. And now I can compare. Right? Much easier to compare. 2a squared minus 4 and 8a squared. You can start plugging things in. a is 0. a is 1. See what you get. What if I have the following? What about... I'm going to give you a tough one. Yeah. What about this one? <laughs> oh my gosh, these numbers are giant. What can I do? Yeah! <laughs> I can start getting rid of those zeros, boy. Right? I can get rid of the zeros. Yeah. Or I can take a whole number. Like, I'm going to divide both sides by 2 million. <laughs> right? So I'm going to divide this whole thing by 2 million. And so I'm going to divide this whole thing by 2 million. Which means I can cancel 2 million and 4 million leaves me a 2. So now I have 30 million. Oh yeah, the one on the right hand side is 30 million as well. And you could have done this a variety of different ways. But very quickly, you'll see that they're equal. So I can take big, ugly, honking numbers and I can add and subtract from both sides. I can multiply and divide from both sides so long as I'm playing with positive numbers. I gotta be really careful, <laughs> really, really careful if I'm dealing with numbers that might not be positive. So what would be some ways, for example, of, of manipulating, here we go, something like this problem. And then we'll get back to our very last one. Nice. And we could do two things, right? So an average of three numbers is their sum divided by the number of terms. And this is you know, 0 0.5, or I like fractions, so a half of x plus a half of y, half of y plus half of z, all, all divided by three. I can multiply both sides by three. Yay. <laughs> and then if I didn't like dealing with these stupid fractions, I can multiply both sides by two. And so this side is you know, 2x plus 2y plus 2z. I'm comparing that to x plus y plus z. And I can start plugging in numbers, right? And I'd think about plugging in positive numbers and negative numbers, maybe if they were all zero, right? And I could test from there. But anytime you've got these common pieces. All right, so we're gonna put one piece together then. What in the world could you do about something like this? Let's game plan for a minute, all right? So as you think of stuff, I want you to just type it in the window. Ooh, maybe I could. Ooh, what if we could? Give me your ideas. Hey, okay, so I love both of these things. So I've got one vote for like, you know what, if I added the two to the ninth and the two to the eighth to one side, it would bring them over to the right hand side. And then I'd have like two two to the eighths and two two to the ninths. 
I had another great idea. This is a really fun one. Remember that we can multiply through and factor out. If it looks like you've got sort of the same types of things, you might be able to factor. And in this case, I can. I can factor a two to the eighth out of both sides. So I take two, I take eight twos out of this stack of 11s. That leaves three left. And I take eight twos out of this stack of nine. That leaves one two left. And I take all of the ones out of that one, which just leaves a one. And here I end up with two there and one here and one there. Those are much easier numbers to manipulate. I can divide both sides by two to the eighth because it's a positive number. So it's like that thing didn't even matter. And now I just have a much easier thing to try and compare. Eight minus two minus one, four plus two plus one. I got seven versus five. Quantity B is bigger. So our goal is to either see things that are the same on both sides, right, that we can already right away just eliminate, or try to think about how we could rearrange the two sides so that there's something in common that we could cancel. So maybe it means we multiply things out and we, we foil through, right, or we distribute, or maybe we factor so that we can then cancel common terms. This idea of simplifying across your quantities is honestly one of those things that nowhere near enough people embrace. And I find that it makes so many QC problems infinitely easier by doing so that, you know, it breaks my heart that people aren't practicing it more. <laughs> so what I'd love to see you guys do is just try. Every time you see a new problem come up, you're just going to think, could I simplify this? Could I look for commonalities on the two sides and find ways of either factoring them or multiplying them through? All right, so icing on the cake, we'll take this last one. This was down to x squared plus xy, 2xy, this is the one we saw before. All right, x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. And over here, x squared minus 2xy plus y squared. We were able to cancel out those common terms. And so our simple hidden inequality becomes 2xy compared to a minus 2xy. Now I could divide both sides by 2 just to get those out of the way, or I could rearrange it. So this goes to that, like, wait, could I combine the two and the, the two to the eights together on both sides? Can I like move stuff to one side? You certainly can, right? You certainly can. So you could add two x y to both sides. So now you have four x y compared to zero. And in fact, I could divide by four because I know that's positive. And so now, really, all I'm doing is I'm asking: Is x y positive or negative? Now I can test out numbers to see, are X and Y going to have the same sign? Are they like both positive numbers or both negative numbers? Um, are they going to have to have different signs? And based on this relationship, I'm going to test out a few different cases. Is it okay if they have the same sign? It's going to turn out that it's not, that these two can't actually have the same sign. So you try some numbers that do have the same sign. You'll try some numbers that don't. You can find the pattern pretty quickly that the correct answer is quantity B. You can find this and a bunch of other similar questions in our five pound book. I encourage you to take a screenshot of this one, right? And maybe poke around it a little bit. Correct answer is in fact quantity B. But let's just take one final moment and, you know, assess. When is it? I want you to think for yourself. Jot down on your paper, right? Make a note. When is it that I can simplify this way? What are the ways that I can tell that I might be able to simplify by canceling out common terms? Right. What struck you as like, oh yeah, if I see this or if I notice this, I want to remind myself to simplify. And then and check us out. We're always here to help in person or online. We have plenty of upcoming classes at all sorts of times of day and night, <laughs> any day of the week. Right? as well as self-study options. So we hope we'll see you around soon and come back and see us for another free GRE prep hour. We'd love to have you. And thanks for all your hard work today, guys.